Freedom Business Guide, Episode 12. So we pretty much wasted two months of our time. <laughs> oh, that's a big tip for you at home. If you... Yeah, very difficult experience, but it's so rewarding. Welcome to the Freedom Business Guide, where guys like you come to start and succeed with an online business that gives you the freedom for world travel, fun, and adventure. Tune in twice a week for interviews with successful freedom business owners each Monday and follow your host's progress from start to freedom each Friday, which will teach you the best strategies and strengthen your mindset to pursue your dream lifestyle. Head over now to freedombusinessguide.com to download your limited free copy of the Freedom Business Guide. This ebook and video mini series outlines exactly how you can get started this weekend with the five extremely common mistakes most freedom seekers make for you to avoid to reach freedom faster. Now, welcome your host, Gun Hudson. Good morning, or oh, whatever time of the day it is, wherever you are in the world. Today's interview is with Lova Kramer, another SSM Mastermind member. And Lova and I actually joined SSM around the same time, about a year and a half to two years ago, I think it was. So it was fantastic catching up with Lova and seeing what he's been up to the last six, or, six months or so, as last time I saw him in person was at the Bulgaria Live Meetup. Lova is launching a book named Why Not Three? He gets into a lot about what the book is about and his journey to become an author, which is very interesting as Lover is actually the first the first friend or the first colleague who is to undertake writing in a book, which I think a lot of people do have on their bucket list, but it seems like a very daunting task. So he has some great advice on how to do that on how to get that done. The actual book is about work life balance and he talks about Often you need to break your life up into work, life, and relationships. And the title of his book is saying, Why Can't You Have All Three? As uh, sometimes it seems like you can only have two. He has some really awesome advice. Uh, This is a very enjoyable, I think, and very important interview for a lot of entrepreneurs out there, including myself. I'll be listening to this a few times. So I really hope that you enjoy it. Without further ado, welcome to the show, Lova. Lova, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's been great to have you. It's been quite an effort for us to chat together. <laughs> yeah, the time zones is always an issue there. <laughs> yeah, finally, we have everything working and uh, I've got a great show prepared for everybody today. So before we get into everything that we're talking about, I'd like to start off with hearing your own entrepreneur story. Have you always been an entrepreneur or... Is that just something recent? Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. So uh, actually, I never identified as an entrepreneur because there's quite a stigma in our society. Like, oh my God, everybody wants to be an entrepreneur. So I I never identified myself as one until last summer when a friend of ours, Chris, uh, Chris Masco, he told me, um, yeah, that's that's the life of an entrepreneur. When I was telling him with uh, with an issue that I had at that time, which I don't even remember now, um, and until that point, I never identified myself as an entrepreneur. What I I was talking with my girlfriend about this yesterday, actually, um, and I just I never did stuff to become an entrepreneur. I always did stuff to become more free, I guess. I had my, so I was doing law school. And the issue with that is that I need time to study, right? So in the beginning, I had a lot of jobs to to be able to cope with uh, living alone and studying, but it wasn't manageable. So then I started um, I founded Lightning Video Editors, where I started uh, shooting commercials for companies, and suddenly I did with one company uh, what I was doing with pretty much eight jobs. So I was earning more money and I had more time. And the more I started investing into my company, time and money and stuff like that, the more I started realizing that if I go this road, or this entrepreneur road, I guess. I would just have more time for myself. I could uh, allocate it to studying. I could do that. Um, 
there's a lot there's a big misconception that entrepreneurship takes a lot of time it does take a lot of time true but it t- it takes less time than law school i can tell you that and um uh, yeah that's kind of how i ended up becoming an entrepreneur i guess if you would call me that because um i am right now yeah just finding time and entrepreneurship is the way where is the is the best way to find time i guess if you if you know how to automate if you know how to delegate um and if your brand obviously is recognized uh, because in the beginning there's a lot of hours that you put into it just to get your brand recognized and that's something i won't deny that's a pretty huge statement and where you said uh yes it takes a lot of time but nowhere near as much time as law school yeah yeah <laughs> that's a pretty huge statement and that's the reason why i'm releasing my book um because I truly believe that work-life balance is just, it is not only like necessary to become an entrepreneur, to become successful. Um, it's, you can, you can do, you can do it differently. If you go just nonstop business for the next two, three years, you are going to suffer in the long run. I've done it and I've suffered really badly um, from this whole focusing solely on one thing, losing your relationships, uh, doing all of that. And then when I discovered that having a balance actually makes you more productive, makes you value time more, makes you do more. Um, that was, that was a huge mind blow that I had and partially came from also like the SSM course with the whole automation and delegation stuff, like letting go of doing stuff. I was always thinking, oh no, nobody else can do it for me. And then when I delegated my first task, that was so amazing, that feeling, suddenly having time. And like the first thought that pops up is like, what should I do with my time? Like, oh no, what do I do now? (laughs) (laughs) And yeah, you always find things to do funnily enough. So I used the time to study to to do marketing actually to get in more sales so it's a pretty bold statement but uh by now i've done the workshop for why not three um which is the company behind the whole book um i've done it in four countries in front of 100 plus people and the results are always the same we have so many testimonials of people saying yeah i'm doing way more making like creating time for family and friends and they're like reconnecting with old friends we had a guy uh, who said on a testimonial that he's reconnecting with old friends and that was something like you just don't think something like that would happen after one workshop oh wow dude i'm so looking forward to this chat for the listeners at home we started out our journey in the ssm course together and yeah we were we were hustling alongside each other for several months but we've we've been uh, parted for maybe six months you know working hard on our own things and sounds like you've been up to heaps i'm really looking forward to it yeah I'm also looking forward to hearing what you uh, what you did in the last six months. I think I think the listeners of the podcast are too, as I haven't got an episode out for a while. So yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, be a good chat. So, firstly, um, what what got you from not thinking about being entrepreneurial, or you were studying law, and then um, yeah, how did you get into it? Like, wh- why the change, or what prompted you to change? Yeah, so that is very, that's a very, I'll try to make it short. So it's a long story because it starts when I like was five or six. And since I was five or six, I think my parents told me like, you should become a lawyer because I was always the kind of person that always had an answer to something, which I've learned to filter down now because uh, some people perceive you um, with the wrong impressions because you always come trying to help but um yeah first impressions is always everything in business i've learned so yeah my parents always told me you should become a lawyer it always it always seemed like something cool to do um knowing how the system works knowing how our rules work knowing what to do when 
when like my mentor told me once when shit hits the fan you would know what to do and that was just the ideal thing a lawyer he knows everything pretty much and then as i went to university as i was going through my courses um i started realizing that you actually don't know everything because you have to focus down on one bit so i focused down eventually on corporate law um because somewhere in the middle of my studies that was about what was it two years now right that we joined ssm um yeah we, i think so yeah. Yeah. yeah so so about that time i was forced to to obviously choose and i just entered ssm so obviously i was going i decided to go this business road so i started focusing down on corporate law which is very nice uh because then you know what's happening on that side and it's always the most complex side um and yeah so as i was going through the courses i realized more and more that business started ta- picking up um and I started seeing my friends graduate and that is one of the hardest things to do because if you choose to focus on two stuff obviously you can't do them as fast as you would do so law school obviously wasn't I wasn't doing the normal courses I wasn't going um the 3 year or bachelor line I was doing a, a couple of more years just in order to get my business up and running and at one point which is about it's really recently a couple of months ago 6 or 7 months ago i started making really big sales and i realized that um all the friends that were graduating were making maybe 2k a month um if they were lucky 3k a month but then you didn't calculate the taxes into it so eventually i was making way more money than them um in a way more consistent matter because i was building a brand obviously so my sales only grow and i was building my network so yeah i started realizing that there's more potential in business than there is in law and then you see all those tv shows like suits i love suits but the things that they cut out is like the the all nighters that they do to to make their research happen and Yeah, funnily enough, it's exactly like that in law. You really sit there and it's not like my cross where you just grind everything out in one night and you have the answer to the question. It's more like you sit there for months every night, you try to pull an all-nighter. Obviously, you can't manage to do it all night. And then most of the time it's not even sure if your answer is right. So you just have to yeah, make sure that the professor likes it. and business is more straightforward for me there's a system there's there are steps that you just follow i guess and you just have to do your research and you have to put put in your time and that is something that i learned from university that is the biggest lesson that i take away the discipline to sit there research and just do the boring stuff hours after just so much stuff and if you do that in business there's Yeah, I see a lot of people failing because they just don't want to do the boring stuff. That's a a very big takeaway. You don't regret going to university. You you value those skills that you've learned. No. I actually I I am very into Casey Neistat and all of his vlogs lately. And one of the things he keeps saying in his vlog is like whenever you don't know what you should do in life, you should um go take the the most boring job that there is which is for him it was dishwashing right well for me i love the law but sitting there nobody's going to deny it even if they love the law it's boring like sitting there researching things that you're probably not going to use and that was what the law was for me it's i started discovering my passions outside i started discovering how to research discipline all of that stuff it was just right there for the taking and had i not invested all the time in university i would have never learned those skills uh plus on top of that you really do grow your brain i don't know how to phrase it i'm not a biologist obviously but the things that i am learning right now um i'm finishing up law school right now So the things that I'm learning right now, if you would have given me like even one chapter of that book in my first year, I would not be able to process that information. 
I am learning. I just finished Penal Law a couple of weeks ago. That was uh, a book that was 500 pages. And next to that, I had another 200 pages of notes. And next to that, I had maybe double of that uh, just in slides. So we're talking about 1,000, 1,500 pages for every subject. And I have five subjects every semester. And I have to process all of that information. And I need to know every detail. So I don't need to know the general lines. I need to know the details. So having that skill is amazing. And you, what, when you study all of that, you start realizing, oh, do I want to do this? Like, can I spend the rest of my life doing this? And then obviously sometimes the things that pop up are, no, I don't want to do this. So what should I do? And SSM or other business courses, especially YouTube sometimes, the TED Talks, they start pointing you in directions that you're more passionate about. So I highly recommend people to go study um, in university just because you should always train your brain. And reading a book is fine, right? I mean, reading a book, obviously you grow. But it's not 1,500 pages in one month that you need to memorize in detail. If you're able to do stuff like that, like when you go later into business and you pick up a book that's 150 pages, for instance, I love the book The Compound Effect by Darren Hardy. I read that book in less than a day and I know most of the stuff because it's a tiny thing compared to the stuff that I study. Yeah. That's that's and awesome. I know I know a lot of I just I just filmed a project for TEDx a couple of months back in November, and that that guy we uh, became friends, and he told me about um, the guy who who used to organize TEDx Brussels, and this guy is crazy. He founded forty four companies in his lifetime. I think he's like sixty something Jeez. now. He's working now in his company uh, with NASA. And this guy reads one book a day. And then you think, how does a person like that do that? And I'm telling you, the way you do that is by pushing your brain. You see all these university students, like during exam period, everybody crashes. Everybody starts crying. Everybody breaks down. And it's so normal in university. Like (laughs) everybody just accepts that, right? Yeah. But the reason why they do that is they push themselves. It's like going to the gym. You go to the gym, if you really push yourself to the limit, you start throwing up. I mean, your brain can't throw up, right? But it can break down and you can start crying. That's what you're doing with university. So I highly advise people to to go that road. But then I also have to um, say that in Belgium, we don't have to pay for university. We have like a small sum. It doesn't cost us much. So if you have the opportunity to to go to university, to push your brain and be able to absorb information so much more, yeah, I am, I, yeah, without university, I would not be able to perform the way I perform right now. Uh, That's a great tip because a lot of people are um, championing, you know, drop out of uni, go become a business person. And I didn't, I mean, the thing is, I, I, there, there are cons and pros to the whole story, but I can tell you the people that have been to university by far process information way faster than uh, non-university types. But uh, sometimes, I mean, it doesn't mean that you can't get there. You can still learn without being in university as long as you push yourself really hard. And then after a couple of years, you'll be at the same level as those people. The only thing that you don't learn in university is how real life works. And that is something that I guess I understand that those people say, which is drop out and everything, uh, because you don't really learn real life skills. Um, When you go into business the first time, for instance, I went into business the first time I needed to do bylaws for my company. And obviously I study law, right? But I tell you, I did not understand anything about how to make bylaws. And it's only when I sat down with a friend uh, that was a bit further in the studies, um, we started doing the bylaws together. And then at one point it started clicking. So there is like a gap between theory and practice. And the people I think that recommend to dropping out and just going after business, if your business is already profitable, of course, um, I think what they're, what they obviously have experienced is 
real life practice, which obviously trumps theory by far. Yeah. Well, it's good to see the, the positives and to take, uh, to recognize what you did get from that. Um, yeah. I like that a lot, actually. I like that attitude. Well, we're definitely going to get into your book and uh, by the sounds of it, your workshops later in the episode. Uh, first off, I've got a question for you. I tagged you in an Instagram post just before our chat and checked out your Instagram yeah, so- and it's flying along. So do tell, what have you been doing? <laughs> for the listeners at home, what is your Instagram? Yeah, what's your name that they can look you off and follow? Um, I think it's just... What was it, Lova Kramer? Lova underscore, underscore Kramer, yeah. We'll, we'll put that in the show notes. Okay. And actually, yeah, at the moment, good. there are no show notes. You need to go to freedombusinessguide.com. There's a, a link if you click on the artwork or just type that into your browser. And all that is is an email sign-up. So you'll get emailed all these notes uh, for the time being. So, all right, continue. Very recently... Um, I wasn't very into uh, Gary V, but very recently I started picking up on uh, his YouTube channel. I'm a filmmaker, so obviously when there's good cinema, uh, cinematography on YouTube, I tend to enjoy and watch those. Uh, he got a really good video, guys, so that's that's a really good step he took. And yeah, I'm guilty of watching his vlogs sometimes. And one of the things that you start noticing about him is that he's very into the whole direct marketing like snapchat and and he's very like big on instagram as well and i started looking into the whole medium of instagram and it's a very untapped marketing yeah marketing tool i guess um because instagram has so many rules it's so hard to break through in instagram when you just start off I was very focused on Instagram in the beginning when I first discovered it, which is very funnily enough, not even a couple of months ago, because I was focusing on Facebook, figuring out how Facebook could work, uh, stuff like that. And so when I first focused on Instagram, I started realizing there are so many rules. Uh, Like I started liking a lot, commenting a lot, following all those things that people say you should do on Instagram and at one point Instagram actually blocked me uh, but only for 24 hours so if you get that message you're following to a lot we've blocked this uh, thing to follow Um, that's just 24 hours so don't worry about that yeah and I was just doing that and it was growing so slowly so then I got on this blog post I was just googling I don't remember the blog post uh, what the title was but it was pretty much how to grow on Instagram and this guy said that you should uh, initially to get some social proof you should buy some followers right Um, and then you can go on Fiverr or something like that and get like I think you can get like 3,000 followers for five bucks so initially that's what I did because I was growing so slowly and I needed to have more um, social proof on that medium in order to start growing because I don't think people follow people that only have like 50 followers so initially yeah I cheated on that part and after that I just started posting regularly we experimented with some times midnight tends to be not the perfect thing also you need to be in context like for instance if you post um, that you ran at 5 a.m. in the morning but you post that around 8 p.m. so you're running at 5 a.m. right don't post that at 8 p.m. because people tend to not like that stuff because running at 5 because to them it seems like you're running at 5 p.m. and that's not so cool so and I posted the same video today and it got like double the likes it had last week when I posted it so yeah I do tend to repost some stuff as well um I'm very I'm very playing on the social proof part which is if I get a picture that doesn't have many likes I tend to delete it and repost it um on a better time of day so just to see that and that way when people come on my page what they see is pictures that have enough likes Um, and stuff like that I do notice that the more followers get like the more followers I get um, and that's something I'm battling right now I I tend to get some followers but usually they're businesses or something like that and so they're not very engaging 
So I think I was targeting the wrong area. So I'm, I'm tar- obviously I changed my targeting this month. So I'm still testing it out for this month. But if this like goes on like this, I'll probably change the person that I'm targeting. And because I, I don't have that many engaging people. But the reason I'm so focused on Instagram is very simple because a couple of months ago when I first started doing Instagram and everything, I got one like I got this one subscriber on my email list. Now you have to realize my program is not launched yet. So we don't have people on the email list. We have like what was it 20 people right now nothing is launched yet um i'm launching maybe in two weeks and when i saw this person coming from instagram to like uh, subscribe to my email list like that was it i was like oh like i need to focus on this stuff i know it's small but yeah i tend to i tend to grab onto successes a lot I'm very much on upselling as well in business. So I guess that's my personality. <laughs> so are you using a tool to manage this or? Yeah. So I was talking with actually someone who is on your podcast, a common friend of ours, uh, Ta- Thomas Alex Norman. Oh, Tom Norman. Yep. Episode three, I think. Yeah. He's focusing a lot on Instagram as well. Yeah. He's doing and great. I, I was talking to him, I was talking to some other people and also checked out that blog post and that blog post that was after the conversations. And Tom, for instance, does a lot of videos. I started doing a lot of videos as well. And then I also, uh, and that was on that blog post that you could find there are some bots. um, So there's this one website um, called instagress.com and they they give you a three-day trial and what it does is they take pretty much all of the time I was spending. Um, I was doing the mornings, she was doing the evenings, and we were just following, commenting, all of that stuff. And it pretty much takes all of that and it does it for you. And you just click on start. I mean, you set the settings, like what do you want the bot to do? Then you click on start and it just follows, comments, and likes. So, yeah, that's pretty much what we're doing right now. It literally took the last two months of our work and it automated the whole process. So we pretty much wasted two months of our work. <laughs> well, there's a big tip for you at home. If you're trying to grow your Instagram, check yeah. out Instagress and you've just saved two months of your life. <laughs> yeah, it's super cheap as well. Um, you get what was it 30 days for ten dollars oh perfect um and you have three days to test out so you'll see what it is because you can pause your time as well so if you only do 12 hours every day that means you have 60 days does that run so it's really uh, from it do you need a computer sitting at home doing that or does it run from the cloud it runs it from the cloud so you just click on start and you exit the google oh nice nice Uh, so yeah so it took that away from us and now we're focusing again on Facebook um, which is I have an entire plan done for Facebook which we're going to do in two weeks so if you see some stuff popping up (laughs) I'll I'll check out I'll keep my eyes open cool Uh, yeah I'm really fascinated in Instagram I've been doing a lot of research for my travel company Uh, we are also going to target Instagram pretty heavily and there will be a lot more talks about Instagram on the podcast in the future. And I'm bringing on a dedicated guest just for that topic. Uh, so really, yeah, it's a bit of a surprise, but uh, keep keep listening to find out more. <laughs> I do have to say the one thing that I've learned from Instagram till now, and I'm not um, obviously I'm not the one the like that person who's dedicated to it but what i learned is instagram alone is not enough you have to have a youtube channel you have to have facebook and you have to connect all of them together because um growing only your instagram is just very hard yeah i think who is it that says the uh you need to be seen three times like in three different mediums i'm not sure there's a few people say that i think, I think it was i think it was Tim, who said you need to be seen seven times. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for those tips. Uh, those All of that will be in the show notes and in the email. Again, you can get that email at freedombusinessguide.com. 
So yeah. uh, next, I really want to hear about your book and your workshops and everything that you're up to. Uh, go for it. What? Yeah, okay. So where to start? Um, the book came out of nowhere. So I have a film production company um, and that is running and I don't plan to leave it uh, because I love working. Um, yeah, just making commercials, funny commercials for people, making after movies and stuff like that. Um, I'm specifically focused on conferences there. So you meet really great people. And the funny thing about when you define your one key fan, the person you want to work with, which is for me, conference uh, organizers, you tend to learn a lot from them. And one of the things that I learned is that of course it's awesome to get your message across on a medium that is very followed which is usually conferences and I was speaking for a student organization for a couple of years now and at one point it just sparked to me it just came to me which is I was filming all these big conferences and I had the student organization uh, which is called ISEC, which is one of the biggest student organizations in the world right now. I think there are 130 plus countries or maybe 120 plus countries. And they have maybe 500 conferences every year. And then it, it's like, it came to me, why should I only film conferences when I can also be filmed? So I I started becoming what is, what's called an ISEC, a facilitator which is in short and in English, just an international speaker where you go to conferences and you get, uh, we call them home groups. So you get 10 to 15 people. And for that weekend, you give them session after session. So usually a conference, a normal conference is usually three to four days. And then you get your group around uh, 9, 9 a.m. till what was it, like 7 p.m.? And every hour or every two hours, you deliver a workshop to them. So I'm pretty much delivering 30 or 40 work workshops in, in one weekend. And that is a crash course to public speaking there. <laughs> and one of the workshops, so I had been doing this for a while now, right? And then I came to a conference in Germany and I had a home group, again, 10, 15 people. And again as many uh, workshops as normally it was a five-day conference actually so even more that was the conference where I slept two hours every night and it was painful <laughs> and one of the workshops there was an external workshop so you have your home group and you have an external workshop so this external workshop is not with, with the people that you're um, comfortable with these are just people that sign up to it because they're interested. And one of the workshops was called Work-Life Balance. It was assigned to me because, I don't know, it was just like that. I think it was at random assigned. And we didn't know what to deliver. I had um, a co-facilitator with me, so a co-speaker. And the first time we, pop, we hopped on the Skype call, we discussed what we should talk about. And we didn't know because work-life balance is super abstract. Everything we had heard before in conferences was pretty much horrible. You couldn't use any of it. Um, sometimes you had something tangible, but you didn't really know how to implement it. So I just said, okay, we both kind of don't know what to say. Let's just kind of use some principles that we've used in the last couple of years. Um, and I took... I took three simple principles. Uh, it was a 90-minute workshop, so I divided three principles over 30 minutes. And it was pretty much dividing the meta aspect of your life, which is um, how do you divide it? How do you start improving every part of it, but having it in a system and keeping it structured? Then going uh, from there to a bit broader um, not broader than meta, but a bit more focused down, but still broad, which is how to set your goals. What is the maximum amount of goals and focuses that you can have in your life while still balancing everything. And then from there on, we went super focused, which was the day to day and the minute to minute. And then we sat down and we saw what models uh, each of us used. And we realized that uh, 
apparently I had done a lot of research in this topic uh, because of my situation, which is founding several companies and law school at the same time. Uh, we used the simple principles that I had, the three principles, and we delivered that workshop. So I attribute a lot of how the workshop started to her because she was uh, very sensitive to it and it built how the workshop became. So she, she took at least, I think, 20 minutes just to ask for expectations. She asked expectations, what the people expect from the workshop and everything. And it's so good that she did that at the time, my co-facilitator, because I didn't know how bad this problem was. I didn't know that people were so hurt. They didn't know they didn't know how to focus on stuff or when they did know how to focus, they didn't know how to stop and kind of pause and focus on their friends and family or on their health and then come back to that focus. So we heard a lot of bad stuff uh, popping up. At one point, so we were standing there and at one point one girl uh, lifts her hand and she asks, I would like to know how to divide life, like how to define life. And I'm standing there and I'm pretty much a kid, you could say. And I'm standing there and I'm saying, you realize this is like a 90 minute workshop, right? And yeah, so we wrote everything down and I have it actually recorded, not the entire workshop because obviously I didn't know it was going to be this big as it is now, but I have the original workshops and were recorded on my pocket cam. And we delivered that workshop. I personally gave every person that lifted their hand an answer to everything. We had like a long Q&A, uh, which is part of the workshop as well. And we started at the end of the workshop, which is what I always do when I set expectations. I start crossing it off like a checklist and everything was crossed off. And for the first time, I think I maybe delivered 100 plus workshops at that point. For the first time ever, I felt that that one workshop was for me the one that impacts the most people it's like the 80 20 rule um you know it right yeah where it's like you instead of delivering an entire conference of five days and 40 workshops you just take one workshop that impacts the most people and that workshop suddenly i realized was that workshop for me and people came up to me and gave me such I guess praise uh, to what it was and how it helped their lives, and the uh, and that's when it like hurt me the most. Actually, people started asking me for more time. I couldn't give it to them. I couldn't give it to them because that conference was so hectic. I told you I slept two hours a night. Uh, we had a delegate who who had to go to the hospital a couple of times because she fainted. Um, she had. Uh, hyperventilation or something like that we had to like tend to her and help her and yeah it was a very hectical conference and I couldn't help the people that needed it kind of the most as well they asked me for more time they asked me to help them figure out specific things that obviously I couldn't go deeper in in the workshop because it was so personal and the, my only answer to them was I wish I could help you but I don't have the time. So obviously I gave them the opportunity to message me afterwards and everything, but usually as it goes, uh, people tend to become very scared of messaging, which is what I found when when you're uh, coaching people. Um, when they pay you, they're happy to ask you a ton of questions, but when they don't pay you, they're scared of taking up your time. <laughs> so yeah, I. I couldn't help them that much, I guess, with a couple of people, the people that are testimonials on the website. Obviously, I could have a chat with them. It was cool to see how their lives had changed, even if it was like tiny changes for some, it was big, which is awesome to hear. And so I came back, uh, I cooled down a couple of days, and I think I say that also in the video on, uh, on the website. I cooled down for a couple of days, and I talked with my girlfriend. I also talked with a friend and talked with so many people about what had happened. And at one point it just popped in my mind and I was like, maybe I should write some kind of pamphlet. Um, some pamphlet with the principles that obviously I go a bit deeper because I had more than 90 minutes to write in my book. And 
Yeah, so I decided to write that book on what was it the 16th of august or something like that uh, like the date is in the book uh, so i decided to write that book which was a pamphlet at the time and i started writing it and you know it's like when you're undervaluing yourself i guess which tends to happen with a lot of entrepreneurs i guess yeah definitely uh, but i thought I thought, okay, I'm going to just write a pamphlet because, you know, nobody writes a book, right? <laughs> so I was like saying to my girlfriend, okay, yeah, so this pamphlet's going to be like 20, 30 pages. And then I hit 20 pages and I wasn't even in the intro. Like I wasn't even in chapter one um, or I was just in chapter one or something like that. And so it became 30, 40 pages. And it was really funny. My girlfriend started laughing every time because I was saying, oh, yeah, no, it's going to be 50 pages. And then I hit 50 pages. And then, yeah, 60, 70. I'm not going to go over that. Eventually, it became something like 130 to 140 pages. And now I really set the rule of, like, I'm not going to go over 150. The book is written pretty much, but it just came out of the first editor. So I need to implement all of those changes. So it's very possible that it might hit over 150, but then I will be cutting down uh, the non-essentials out of it. So yeah, that's pretty much the book is. The book is practically the whole workshop. So it has three chapters and a bonus chapter. Not three chapters, but three parts. And every part goes deeper on every part that I had in the workshop. And the idea is then to give people more of my time I guess um, to elaborate more on the principles that I gave them in the workshop the, but the workshop is very I think essential because I always implement a Q&A and then people just ask me all the personal questions um, and the, the funniest bit about that Q&A because I usually think it's going to be 15 minutes to 30 minutes and I was in Holland delivering that, con uh, that workshop and it was I have the entire workshop on camera and it was from start to finish, I think two hours and 15 minutes. So I do, I started a and a around uh, the one hour mark and then you had a and a of one hour, 15 minutes. It was so long. At one point my voice gave up so I, st I needed to like drink water <laughs> uh, just to be able to answer more questions. Dude, and, that's uh, awesome. Yeah. I love it. So that's where we're at right now. So how have you gone in your transition from writing a pamphlet to a book? Have you seeked out any help to to really like, uh, I don't know? Yeah, that journey was completely different to building a business initially because obviously I posted in the forums of, of SSM and the masterminds that we're in. Hey guys, do any of you know authors? And like with most business people, they don't know many authors uh, because they do business stuff. So finding people that knew how to write a book or how to publish a book was a task in itself. But eventually, if you ask around, you always find someone. And yeah, I did find, I, I found a couple of people in my network that actually had written a book. Um, and they, they started telling me that, for instance, if you want to write a book, the biggest tip I can give you is uh, research whether you want to do it published uh, through someone or self-published because if you are uh, because I'm, I can assume this podcast is for entrepreneurs so entrepreneurs are listening I would suggest for you to launch it yourself because I talked with a lot of publishers in Belgium now and they are so settled in their traditions their marketing is not good uh, if you know a little bit about marketing if you know a little bit about Facebook ads and stuff like that then the chances of you like getting more sales is bigger because they tend to do a lot of offline stuff. And then you also need to know that if you go the traditional route, so if I'm selling my book now for 20 euros or $20, the publisher gets 18 euros from that. So I only see two euros. Oh. And, the fu and the funny thing, and this is the myth, right? That you think, oh, I'm going to just outsource that stuff to the publisher, right? He's going to do the marketing and sell my book. No, it's not true. Only if you're like some big shot, like a huge, you have a huge following, will they actually allocate their resources to that? Because they know it's pretty much like if they launch it, they, they're going to sell it, right? Yeah. So only if you're that kind of person will they do proper marketing for you. 
but I've heard from people that aren't that big that publishers ask you to do your own marketing. So you have to build your own following and do all of that, which is something I was doing anyway. And then the question back, like, question pops up, why should I then go the traditional route? Because you can self-publish and later also get another publisher, but then you will have more ground to stand on, I guess, because the book is there, the cover is there, you have a following, uh, there isn't much marketing to be done, only the scaling of the marketing needs to happen. So then you can also t- uh, tell your publisher, okay, we can do 50-50. That's cool. So, yeah. And then also Amazon has an amazing uh, way of publishing, which costs almost nothing. If you go to Creative Space, I think, or something like that, uh, they are independent from Amazon, but they collaborate with Amazon, I think. Or maybe they are Amazon, I'm not completely sure. But they have really good rates, they do international shipping, and my friend who published through them uh, showed me his book on a picture, and it looked really amazing. So so you're actually yeah. getting physical books printed and shipped out to people that buy them? Yeah, yeah. My goal for this whole thing was to have a physical book. I don't want, obviously, like I'll have probably an ebook or something, but the goal is to have a proper book. And the reason why is actually a little bit selfish, because... I tend to forget the stuff that I teach people in the workshops. That that sounds bad, but what I mean with that is I want to be reminded of those simple principles. I know they exist, but keeping yourself accountable to it is something different. And I have this thing called the silent day, which I wrote a blog post about on my website. And it's the first thing that people learn in the workshop, which is every Sunday, no matter what, all electronics go away. Everything goes away. Every stimulation, just I don't talk, I don't eat um, till six o'clock. All electronics are off and I just relax. And I think about my future. I think about where my life is going and stuff like that. I think if I'm living up to my core values and things like that. And if I didn't have that day before, so before I started the whole why not three thing, I discovered the silent day a couple of months ago after, after the workshop, because I was starting to become more into this whole work-life balance thing. And it's actually from, from a book, uh, John Gray, um, he talks about how I'm, I'm forgetting the title, but it's something with hyper stress, how to live in a hyper world or something like that. And he talks about how that one silent day, obviously I've built out my silent day to be something different to his, but just plugging off for a day helps so much to, to battle your stress symptoms. Um, and I had really bad stress symptoms, like the rash and not being able to focus and like almost ending up in the hospital and stuff like that. So that silent day was really good for me. And what I found is that it's also nice to have something to read on that silent day, especially something that kind of reminds you of what you should be thinking, which is like the goals in your life. Um, and that is why I want that book, um, because I don't, I don't read electronic stuff on my silent day. So I would really love a physical book um, with exercises kind of in it, just like Darren Hardy in the compound effect had to go every week uh, through the same exercises and see if I should adjust something or if I should tweak something. Yeah. And stuff like that. That's why I want the physical book so much. Oh dude, that is very cool. I'm uh, totally jealous. Having, writing a book and having a book is, is on my lifetime goal list. Yeah. (laughs) Don't know, don't know when it will happen, but uh, yeah, that's really cool. One of my, um, I guess you can call him mentors. He sits down every week with me and we have dinner. Um, he used to do that um, at the time when we started a couple of years ago. And he's, he always says one, like he says like that one thing to me, which is every man should uh, have a child. He should plant a tree and he should write a book. <laughs> <laughs> 
I haven't planted. So have you planted a tree? Planted a tree. <laughs> no, I haven't planted a tree and don't have a kid yet, and like I'm not uh, planning to have a kid in the next couple of years yet. I'm still too young. But just touching on what you just said, uh, how old are you for everybody at home that doesn't know? Uh, I am 22. <laughs> 22 yeah awesome and about to publish your own book that's really yeah inspiring for everybody how elrod who wrote the miracle morning he was about my age i think when he wrote his first i don't know he was very young i remember that um but the book that i write is not about how to do it i guess but it's rather a guide that with exercises that refer you to the right people. So the book is pretty much very simple to read. And it, in every action step, I refer to the sources, just like you would in law, you refer to the sources um, that have guided me throughout the last six or seven years now uh, on how to manage everything. So for instance, um, I divide life on the meta level, right? And health, wealth, and relationship relationships. Where did I get that definition? Um, there was a pamphlet on how to cold read people from Kenton Knepper, which I read, what was it now, five years ago? And at the time, that was just a pamphlet for cold reading, right? How to, in 80% of the cases, guess uh, what people are like and talk to them in a way that they think you know them. Um, which, which had some really funny results, but, uh, that's for another podcast. Um, uh, and at one point I remember I was sitting in my room and I saw, like, I wrote, I wrote everything that I learned at the time on my door and I had like in big circles, health, wealth, and relationship. And I was like, I was struggling at the time in dividing my life to focus down on what I should improve because I was really into personal development and so I was like suddenly staring at this thing and I realized, wait, what if I take these cold reading principles and I apply it to my life? Uh, because he, he divides health, wealth and relationships into internal and external components as well. And every, has, every component has a different meaning. So I started realizing that I could use this for my personal development. I could focus first on relationships, then on health. And now I'm focusing on business. And funnily enough, the moment that business started becoming more automated, automatically life kind of for the universe or whatever you believe uh, switched me back to health, which became why not three. But the funny bit is that suddenly I had a clear path for, and I do this every six months, I recalibrate my goals, but every six months I kind of tend to focus on something different, whether it's health, whether it's wealth, whether it's relationships and what I mean with focusing is growing in those things. So maybe in the beginning, I used to learn how to actually talk with people and be social, right? Because I used to be really shy, which is like the what I hear now is like everybody tends to be really shy in the beginning. So I had to learn that stuff too. Uh, but nowadays, what I tend to focus on is more the relationship aspect because the divorce rates right now are horrible. I don't want to end up like that. Um, so I'm very actively pursuing on how to have this amazing relationship that doesn't end up in some huge fights. And for instance, today, actually, we celebrated our six months together and we didn't have one fight, not one fight, uh, which if you would have told me that five years ago when I had relationships, I, I think I had fights every two days. And I didn't, I didn't know why that, why that happened. And, and one of the things that, yeah, that helped me with that is, for instance, a speech that I also posted in the blog post and in my email list, which is um, Will Bowen uh, has a speech on YouTube called The Complaint Free World. And he talks about how you can, he, he gamifies it kind of um, how you can stop complaining. He makes it in, into a challenge, a 21 day challenge where you have these bracelets and every, th every time you complain, you change your bracelet. And yeah, I'm wearing uh, not his bracelet, but I'm, I'm doing that challenge exactly right now. It's on my right wrist. It's been on for three days. Yeah, so. yeah. So that <laughs> is a very, very difficult. Yeah, right? very difficult experience, but it's so rewarding because you start realizing how much negativity 
creativity there is um, in you um, and your brain just tends to think really negative as well. I had my brain uh, till now still sometimes thinks, oh, you're not good enough. You're not going to do that. Like, who do you think you are writing a book? Who do you think you are standing in front of those people? And then I kind of have to push through it and say to myself, no, I've already stood in front of a hundred people. I've already done some crazy stuff in front of a crowd. I can do it. I know this will happen. So I have to push through it. But then I realized when I started doing this complaint free world thing, your brain starts changing. And instead of saying, oh no, you can do it. Suddenly it starts saying, yes, you can do it. And you, um, like in relationships, the same, right? Instead of thinking, oh, when is the next fight going to be? My brain is thinking, this is amazing. And this is going to be for the next like hundred years of my life or whatever. Um, because you start to think positively and every time a, a fight pops up, the first thing your brain thinks is not, oh, of course your fight. No, what it thinks is, oh, why is this happening? This is weird. Let's evaluate why it happened and not let it happen again. But I can tell you, when your brain thinks like that, you're not going to have fights because you're going to just sit down together and talk about what happened and how to progress from there. But I can tell you, like, usually, yeah, if you're very positive, fights don't even tend to happen. Um, discussions that are usually ending up in something funny obviously that's part of a relationship but yeah but real fights no i used to have them so much with past girlfriends and like the last couple of years i just stopped dating girls that tend to have those fights also uh for the girls out there listening also i'd say you went through that development yourself and perceived wrong so obviously the reason fights tend to happen is because you inside think oh no when is the next fight gonna be yeah so you tend to attract that kind of person that you are yeah so if you start if you stop complaining you start to attracting you start attracting people that don't complain um and the, the chances of a fight happening is obviously way smaller. So I had to have an internal change in myself to stop that as well. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Oh, dude, I'm really pumped to read your book. Hopefully everyone at home is too. Have you got an email list somewhere that people can sign up or can we purchase it or pre-order it? Or? Yeah, you can, you can go on the website, uh, why not three, so why just like the word not like the word and three the number so why not three dot com and that's it you can sign up there um there is also a page where you can pre-order the book uh, which you will be put on the email list for now and then i'll update you when it gets released because there is some administration that needs to happen before i, I can actually launch the book and yeah and that's pretty much it. Well, I'll be doing that straight after our chat. Uh, I'm not getting any payment or kickback for this. Uh, just super excited. You're the first friend of mine who's who's written a book. Um, yeah, it's, it's awesome. I, I love having this podcast. I get to have really great chats with a lot of my entrepreneur friends and talk about things that uh, we don't often talk about so in-depth catch up. So this is, yeah. this is great. I love it. <laughs> Last time we had that conversation that was really like long and deep. I remember it was in Bulgaria when we were... We were in Bulgaria. Yeah, yeah. We were with... We had uh, Amida. Roland. Yeah, yeah. That was like five to four people. But that's oh, that something good. good for your viewers. Uh, uh, the way we like ended up is like because we were in the same mastermind group which is like outside it like it was ssm but it was like a small group yeah i want to give another plus one uh to live events i've just meeting up in person especially when we're all in an entrepreneur world number one you get to meet the other kind of people who are taking the effort and spending the money to go and meet similar people as themselves in person. So it kind of cuts out a bit of the riffraff, you know. And number two, it just cements friendships. Like we haven't spoken in over six months, but I'm really looking forward to uh, catching up. If we, Are you going to Vegas? Yeah, I'm going to Vegas. I messaged Tim oh, dude. to ask uh, <laughs> if I could speak there. So I don't know if that's going to happen. But I am going to message like from now on many conferences to start speaking for or not three to get the message across i think it's very inspiring to work towards to to a life where people are more balanced more happy and stuff like that so i really do want to spread the message 
Yes. Yeah. It's uh, what you've spoken about has, has hit me. It's touched sensitive spots that I'm working on in my life. It's um, I think everybody who follows a passion passionately, for lack of a better word, it's it's a tough balance to yeah. to balance those three areas. Yeah. yeah. And if you don't know how to even define it, uh, that balance, then the chances of you hitting the optimal balance is so hard. So, so hard. hard. <laughs> but once you know it, it's really interesting. Well, um. As I said, I'm uh, very keen to read your book. I used to think it was like a Venn diagram. I, I, I came up on my own with those three categories also, money, health, and relationships. And I used to say to myself, I can only manage two. Pick two out of the three and the other one has to die. <laughs> well, I mean, that's not... <laughs> well, okay, so yes and no. So the optimal thing which you would do is you have three goals, which is uh, the second level of my workshop, right? You need to pick three goals, which is called the... Uh, when I first read it, it was called the Warren Buffett method. Now at this point, I think a lot of people stuck their names on it. So, But it was three goals that you choose. And optimally, if you want to balance in that... Each of these goals should be in something that is health, something that is wealth, and something that is relationships. Um, and then you have this perfect thing. So for instance, what could the goal be? Uh, one of them could be your girlfriend or your wife, right? So you mean if she's actively a goal or a focus in your life, you will have time to read a book about your relationship or read on Google on how to plan a perfect date or something like that because it's a it's a focus of your of you and then if your second thing is health then it has internal and external, right? So the internal part could be maybe you're struggling with inner demons. So then you go to a psychologist, you make time to go to that psychologist, or you actively pursue a coach that can help you with your inner demons, or externally, you go to the gym, but it's an active focus. And then the third thing could be business, and then growing your business. So now you're balanced, and you have an active way of tracking all of those things and the thing about wealth and that's a common misconception um, is that there's only money there's an internal and an external part of it the external part obviously is the money everything you own and stuff like that but the internal part is your inner wealth have you traveled um, do you know languages do you know different mindsets can you interact with people and yeah you don't need so much money. Uh, sometimes having experiences is more valuable. And then the the hack, because I love hacking stuff. Um, <laughs> I used to when I was small. I, I yeah, I'm not gonna go too deep into that, but I loved to like get into systems and like get them outside and like i used to like build computers which is uh, for me very funny because i used to break as many as i would build <laughs> and <laughs> i think we all can resonate with uh with that liking to hack stuff yeah so the hack of it is you don't need to just focus on one and just be stuck on that you can like make them you can combine stuff so for instance you can go to the gym together with your girlfriend and so Suddenly what you're doing is you're focusing on kind of one thing, which is um, your health, but you're also doing quality time with your girlfriend. So you can combine stuff and the same with business. So a common question in the workshops is like, so what does that mean? Does that mean I won't have time for family and friends if I have these three focuses that I just mentioned? Um, and then what I said is what I usually say to them. Um, and this is the bad part, I guess, of, of um, the answer, which is you can have more focuses or goals, but you'll start sacrificing your health. And the, the thing about stress is you're not going to see it happening right away. By the time you see it, it's already too late. The way you can do it, however, which is what I did, uh, I started focusing on business. So I started working together with friends and the friends that didn't want to work together with me because they weren't interested in anything I was doing. So for instance, I would film a conference, right? Um, and then I would take a friend with me and he would be the second camera guy or something like that. Or they would go on business meetings together with me because I needed an extra person or I needed uh, to connect with someone and stuff like that. Uh, or I needed to go to a dinner place somewhere like stuff. I started combining business with friends. And then the natural occurrence is that the friends that I couldn't connect in any way because 
they were just either not interested in my business or just doing completely different stuff. Um, those are the friends that I couldn't be um, that actively like involved with. That doesn't mean our friendship goes away. That just means we see each other way less. But that's the natural thing of life, which you can't stop. If you're going to push friendship onto people, you're going to just be so overstressed and eventually that friendship is going to like go away anyways. The best thing you can do is just kind of focus on your thing, come the best at what you do. And then when you have time, which at one point you will have time, you'll just meet up with that friend again and catch up. Very wise advice. Very wise advice. I uh, I'll be reading your book. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds I may I won't dig too deep as I'm really excited to get into it. I think we'll have a very late drunk night in Vegas in in a in a room somewhere chatting until the sun comes up. I'd say. <laughs> uh, I've really really enjoyed this conversation, Lever. I hope a lot of the listeners have also got a, a lot of value from it. And again, I'll give you another plug. Why not three dot com? Go check it out. Sign up to the email list and. And purchase a physical copy of the book so you can read it on your day off and yeah. without uh, electric. I'm sharing a lot of stuff uh, in the email list as well. Every week, I tend to give a personal story away or something that my mentors share. A lot of the influences of my mentors are in, in the book as well. So it's not a product of just me. Great. I'm really looking forward to it. Actually, I will um, just bring one thing up. I, I wrote down... Uh, when you were telling your journey about writing the book and that is your first step was you reached out to someone who'd already done that. Yeah. I, I found that that is probably the biggest shortcut in anything I've attempted in my entrepreneur journey yeah. is, yeah, just, just number one, work out what you want and then go find someone who's already done it. Yeah. One of my mentors called it layering. So when you have this huge mountain that you need to climb, you don't look at the mountain and just go on that mountain you you first you layer you take the next step that you have to do who do you need to contact probably this kind of sherpa guy right um what kind of yeah. gear do you need stuff like like one by one one by one and then at one point you're just on top of that mountain and it's the same here yeah and the other thing that he always said is find the guy who's right in front of you don't model like michael jordan because everybody in our society says oh we need to model like the top guy so if you would play basketball you would model michael jordan the issue is he's not very accessible, is he? He's right. he's like somewhere in America and I'm here in Europe. So the chances of me meeting Michael Jordan and even if I would meet him to have him for an entire day and tell him, oh, what should I do here? What should I do there? The chances of that is very low. But the guy next, like right in front of you, the chances of him going um, and grab a coffee with you for free is very big. So and the only thing you need because you're layering is that next step, right? And then the the skill that you need is obviously knowing when you've learned everything from this person and you need to move on to the next because that sounds harsh. Always stay loyal to people. That's very important for me. But what I mean is absorbing information from them uh, because their mindsets might be uh, limited to some point and you don't want their limitations to be uh, your limitations. So you just find that person that gives you the next step. When you've learned everything, you go to the next person that gives you the next step and so on and so on until one one day you become Michael Jordan. Well, uh, I think I'll wrap it up here. It's been over an hour already. Yeah. Maybe we'll, we'll leave some content for the book and for our next hangout in Vegas. And I'm really inspired to kick out the podcast again. This has been really, really enjoyable. So thanks a lot, Lova. Thank you. And uh, I'll catch you in Vegas. Yeah. Thanks for the chat, Lova. I do apologize as a lot of the end of our conversation had to be edited out there. Uh, my editor did a great job of, of merging it so it wasn't too bad. Unfortunately, our equipment got a lot of feedback during the end of our conversation, but there's some gold nuggets there for all of the listeners. Uh, so I hope that you enjoyed listening to Lova and I chat. Do visit whynot3.com. That's why not and then the number 3.com. Check out everything that Lova is up to. Sign up to the email list and depending when you listen to this, he still may be pre-launch or may have just launched or if you listen to this a year from now, uh, get yourself a copy of that book. I am sure it's going to be an amazing read and I should have mine by then. 